today we're going to talk about uh, double integration. Okay, so as usual, let's kind of take a look back at things we already know and have seen before and we understand. So back in single variable calculus, we learned that integrating under a function or integrating a function over an interval gave us the area in quotes trapped between that curve and the x-axis over the input arrow. Um, the reason it's can quote and the reason I titled it was signed area is because this area is considered to be positive if it's above the x-axis and negative if it's below the x-axis. Okay. And why does that work? Well, we learned that from the definition of integration as Riemann sums. So let's let this thing load here for a second. All right, now this is loaded. So think back to Calc 1, where we learned that integration is defined by Riemann sums, where we think about when you integrate a function over an interval, we're taking thinner and thinner slices and summing up all of them. And you can geometrically think of this as the area here. Um, this is not working on the tablet like I wanted it to. There we go. And so the more slices you get as you take infinitely thin slices, you get littler and littler pieces of area, infinitely thin slices of area, if you will, until you're summing up something that's so infinitely skinny, each of the rectangles are so skinny that it effectively gives you the exact area underneath the curve. It turns out we're gonna do something similar to this in Calc 3 when we get more than one variable introduced and we're thinking about surfaces and things. So let's, spoiler alert, so let's have a look at that. Okay, so the extension of this idea into three space is that we're gonna learn that we're gonna integrate instead of over an interval of length, we're gonna integrate over some region R uh, in the plane as an input region. Yeah, X and Y is the input for the, our function F is equals f of x, y. So x, y points within the plane are your inputs. And so your input can be a region. It's no longer limited to being an interval. So when you integrate over a region, you integrate the surface, we get the volume above the x, y plane being positive and the volume below the x, y plane being negative. So let's take a look at an applet that kind of looks at that and the actual definition of Riemann sums for multivariable. All right, so here you can see we've, we've got two slices in the x and the y direction to give us four rectangle squares underneath our surface. But as we increase the number of slices in both the x and the y direction, we're gonna get a grid that's gonna increase. So eight slices is gonna go to 64 squares and so forth until your input region is so small, you're effectively integrating an individual point and summing up all of those vertical columns of of a volume is going to give you the sum total volume underneath a surface. All right, so here's the actual definition of a double integral. What we do is we change things in both the x and the y direction, take more and more slices, just like we would along the x and the y intervals. Uh, just like we would in Calc 1, but putting them together, we end up with these little squares of input underneath our surface and summing together all of those multiplied the base of that, the area of that base of that square times the height, you'll get the volume and taking the limit as the number of slices in both the X and the Y direction goes to infinity, you end up with the exact volume underneath, well, signed volume underneath the curve. So this sounds kind of, uh, strange, a little bit, or challenging. I'm like, how could we calculate this? So it turns out this is not the way we're going to actually compute this. Rather, what we're going to do is we're going to sort of fix one direction and take a slice, and we're going to generate infinitely many slices in that direction uh, of thin area underneath our curve. So say, for instance, we decided to just fix, fix this slice in the y, we set y equal to whatever number that would be, say it's like three or something. In that case, one, two, we would correspond to this right there. And so you would just have, if you just looked at the plane that this is a part of, 
extending that out. Well, now you're in Calc 1. You're integrating just a, a curve over an oops, I extended that, that line too far. Let's just pretend I didn't put that one out so far below it, and that'll give us that. Yeah, now you're in Calc 1. You're just looking at this red curve up here, integrated over this blue interval down here, and that'll give you the area under the curve. And now if you let this slice vary uh, uh, up and down the y axis, and for each, each varied place, you're going to get a new slice of infinitely thin area. But I'm kind of trying to talk about something abstract, which is actually best shown with a visualization. So we'll do that in a second. And so just like before, and uh, we were kind of in Calc 1, you're integrating over some interval and you're taking thin little rectangles, but when the rectangles get infinitely thin, you're effectively going over a single point and just getting this infinitely thin slice of area, and then the one next to it, and then the one next to it, and you sum that all up and you end up with the, the actual area underneath your curve. Same game here. We fix those slices, and then we're gonna sum up those slices, letting them vary in whichever direction we fixed them first. So here's a nice uh, applet of that. Okay, so here's an example of a nice surface floating around in three space. Yep, and we wanna integrate over this rectangular region shown in the input XY plane below. And if we look here at this slider to the left, we see that Y naught is fixed at negative two and looking up there at the domain of integration where we're, input, we're integrating over the rectangle where X varies from negative one to three and Y varies from negative two to three. So we fix Y to be negative two. Then we let x vary and we integrate across that x interval from negative one to three. And what we would get is just a, a slice of infinitely thin area underneath, well, infinitely thin volume, which is represented by area, um, underneath our curve. And as we, we do this for every single y value across the entire y range, and you sum up all of those little thin slices of volume, you're gonna end up with the entire volume underneath the curve. You can also do this in the other order. So this time, let's say we fix things in the x direction. Uh, and for each x value, we're gonna let, now we're gonna integrate with respect to y, and we're gonna get another plane and other little thin slices of volume. But when you sum those up, you're gonna end up with the same volume, same area, some volume underneath the curve. So that's kind of an introduction to the idea of double integration over a rectangular region in particular uh, in the input plane, x, y plane. So before we go any further down that rabbit hole, let's just talk about integrating functions when they have more than one variable in them. It's gonna be the same process as when we differentiated functions of multiple variables. We just treat the variable that we're not integrating with respect to, so we're not interested in it, as a constant. All right, so this is review. This isn't an example of this. This is just old school single variable calculus integrating from one to two uh, over the interval from one to two, the function x to the third with respect to x. So, whoops, <laughs> fairly sizable error in this. Let's go ahead and fix it. That should be to the fourth power, which is gonna change our numbers here. But the point of this slide is not my mistake. It's just, we know how to integrate with respect to a single variable. Okay, let's hope that error doesn't carry forward to the next slide. It probably will though. All right, so now what changed between the two slides? Well, whether they, we added a y to the integrand. Now our integrand is x to the third times y. And once again, since we're integrating with respect to x, we're only interested in the x expression. We don't care about that y expression. It's a constant. In fact, the mistake is carrying through. So you know what the best thing to do when you make a mistake is get rid of it and start over and try again. So let's just work this thing by hand. Okay, so we're integrating with respect to x. And since we're integrating with respect to x, we're gonna end up plugging in x. Notice that the variable that we're or integrating with respect to matches the variable that we're gonna be plugging into. And this might seem like overkill right now, but I think you'll see why I like to do this when we get into the future. Uh, anyway, for now, task at hand, how do we integrate with respect to X? Well, that's the only thing we're concerned about. We are not concerned about Y. 
So let's go up here, give myself a little bit of room here, equals. Well, if that was a seven, if instead of y, that was a seven, everybody would be like, well, you can just pop that seven outside. Well, y is a constant, it's no different than seven. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go ahead and pop that y out in front. And oftentimes I don't do this, but while we're learning it at first, I think it's a helpful thing to do, to just pop that constant expression out in front so we don't have to look at it. And we've reduced the problem down to now something that we absolutely do, under, do understand, calc one. Okay, so we got y and then integrating one x to the third, we get one fourth x to the fourth power. And we're gonna evaluate that with x equals one, from x equals one to x equals two. Now, maybe you can see why I find it helpful to label what I'm gonna be plugging in for. Since I have more than one variable on the left, it's easy. If I just had written two and one here, I have to then remember, oh yeah, this is the X one. I should be plugging in for X rather than Y. So I like to label all that stuff. Writing a little bit more, it turns out can be viewed as being lazy because I make fewer mistakes. And that's why I'm trying to emphasize this. Um, yeah. All right, so let's go ahead and finish this calculation. All right, so this equals Y is not what we're interested in. So one fourth replacing X with two, the fourth power minus Y one fourth, replacing x with one, just evaluating the definite integral like we know how to do. Um, two to the fourth, there's gonna be four twos and two twos, two twos down here, and that's four twos. And so those reduce and I'm left with, it looks like four y minus, uh, that's just one, one fourth y, uh, 16 over four is 15 over four, y and i'm pretty sure that's correct if it's not forgive me i'm winging this uh okay so yeah that's the idea when you're integrating with more than one variable you just treat the other variable like a constant okay here's another example this time uh and what are we doing here well this may be the way you're presented with problems in the text or in homework problems and things like that. So what's the first thing I redid? Well, I, uh, I said, hey, the variable we're interested in is x, dx. We're integrating with respect to x. That means that y is a constant. The only expression I'm worrying about is the 2x. I didn't need to include the 2 there. I just included it because uh, I'm thinking, hey, 2x is the derivative of? x squared, so it kind of goes in nicely there. But if you had left it out in front, the math will still work. Everything will reduce away, and you'll get the proper answer as well, treated the two as constant. Anyway, the key, what I'm really trying to get at here is I use this differential to tell me, hey, when I'm done, I'm going to be plugging in for x. x is equal to 1, and x is equal to 2y. I'm going to put 2y in for x and, and 1 in for x, so that over here, when I'm ready to evaluate my definite integral, I then know which variable I'm plugging in four. I'm replacing x with these values. So again, the y is a constant. It's just going to come along for the ride. Integrating 2x with respect to x gives us x squared. So we're now evaluating x squared times y uh, from x equals 1 to x equals 2y. So I'm replacing the x down here in this line, replacing those x values with 2y and then 1 respectively, and then simplifying all that stuff down. This, this one becomes 4y squared times y, which gives me 4y to the third, and then minus 1 squared times y is just y. All right, so let's do another example. This time, our differential is, the first thing I look at when I do these problems is, look at the differential. It tells you what's going on. It tells you what you're going to be working with. Looking at that differential, I then rewrite my limits of integration in terms of the variable I will eventually be substituting in for to just help myself not get confused. Remember, hey, I'm working with substituting in for y in this step. Next, maybe next step, as you'll see, maybe the next step you'll be, you know, x equals some stuff. But we're getting ahead of ourselves there. All right, so this time we're going to integrate this thing with respect to y. And so our y variable expressions are all we're interested in. So I chose to treat 5x to the third here 
as the constant. And so we'll just integrate the first term as y to the negative third power with respect to y. And for the second term, I decided to just lump that little six in there because it doesn't really hurt anything. But you could exclude the six and only think of it as a constant and just only integrate the y to the second power. All right, doing the integrations for the first term, five x to the third times y to the negative third, ignoring the five x to the third because it's a constant and just integrating the y to the negative third power, we get this expression using your standard power rule. And then next, we're going to integrate six y squared with respect to y, and that's gonna give us this stuff over here. And then on the next line down, I just tidy up the algebra a little bit. I'm keeping everything highlighted in red to show that, hey, we're gonna substitute in for y here. Again, that differential tells us what we're dealing with, what variable we're gonna be substituting into eventually. And so in the next line, I'm gonna replace these y values with y equals x and then y equals and subtract to that, the whole expression with y is equal to one. And that happens on this line down here. And then from here on out, it just becomes a game of algebra. First expression becomes negative 5x plus 2x to the third. And then to that, we subtract the quantity negative 5 square, uh, 5 over 2x to the third plus 2. Tidying it all that, we get our final answer down below. All right. So without any further context, let's try our first double integral. And I, I've used the parentheses here to emphasize what double integrals actually mean. You may see this written as this without the set of parentheses. It's very, very common. But right now, the parentheses show that, hey, order of operations seems like they still apply here. We kind of work from the inside out. And so sure enough, let's do that inner integral. Well, attacking that inner integral, well, let's do it then. Okay, let's attack this inter inner integral. And spoiler, I showed that it needs to be done in blue on the next page, so let's do it in blue. All right, our inner integral. Again, here we go, we're integrating with respect to y, so I'm gonna fix those. We've got y is equal to one, and y is equal to x. They're gonna be the values we're eventually going to replace after we integrate. All right, so five x to the third. Well, let me Let me do this this way. 5x to the third uh, plus 6. Uh, and then now we're ready for our y stuff. y to the negative third, y squared dy. All right, time to integrate. Our first expression, now well, that 5x to the third is just a constant expression. It comes along for the ride. Integrating y to the negative third power, we add one to it. So we're going to get y to the negative second power, one over negative two. Oops, second, did we just do this? Oh, look at that. Spoiler alert. This is the same problem we just did on the prior page. Look at that. So I probably won't finish it out, but let's continue just at least through this first line. All right, uh, plus, well, the six is just coming along for the ride. Integrating y to the second power with respect to y gives me y to the third power times one over third out in front. All this stuff, since it's a definite integral, we're going to evaluate from y is equal to one and y is equal to x. And again, writing it like that shows me that, hey, I'm gonna be substituting in for y values. I'm don't, not concerned with the x values, but substituting in for the y values. All right, so equals dot, 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 nine halves, x to the third minus five halves, x minus two, x to the third minus five halves, x minus two or something like that. The next slide will have it typed correctly. Okay, so we just did that problem. We looked at it twice and we found out that that inner integral value is equal to nine x to the third. And so what we do is we replace the entire inner integral with the result we got once we've done that inner integral. And then we're ready to do the so-called outer integral. Now it's with respect to x. And notice something here. 
there's a it's it's very important in these problems well usually that you don't have any whys here do we anymore we already dealt with all the why stuff we integrated with respect to y and then we evaluated those y's in terms of x and so as a result what we get is always going to be an expression only in terms of the variable of the outer the, uh, that the outermost integral is is uh, being integrated with respect to is interested in if you will so now in the second line i changed that or this next line i changed the blue to red to show that hey now that's the uh, value that we're interested in integrating and sure enough nine halves x to the third integrates as uh, well you're going to add one to get x to the fourth and then multiply by one fourth which makes nine halves into nine eighths and similarly negative five over two x becomes negative five fourths x squared and then minus two becomes minus two x again emphasizing that we're going to plug in for these x values we end up doing a little bit of algebras and we get a final value uh, once we replace those x values with x equals one and x equals two as appropriate we get 89 over eight Okay, so I think this method uh, of labeling our limits of integration to emphasize which variable we're integrating with respect to is helpful. And so I will generally do that and I hope you guys find it helpful too. So iterated integrals, double integrals or even triple integrals as we'll see are oftentimes referred to as iterated integrals. Uh, so uh, you can integrate with respect to X first and then integrate with respect to Y. That's going to look like this. Notice again, I've, I've labeled uh, the limits of integration to match the differentials. Sorry, these highlighters are kind of making the colors look a little bit weird, but hopefully it's still helpful. But we can also do it in the other direction. We can integrate with respect to y first and then with respect to x. Sure enough. The last example we did was an example of this case where we integrated with respect to y first and then later integrated with respect to x. Okay, let's uh, again, let's just kind of keep exploring and say, hey, let's try and use a double integral to find the area of a rectangle in the plane. When you see things written like this, uh, okay, let me read that. Goal, find the area of the rectangle R is equal to uh, the interval one by two by the interval one by three. What this really means is these are your x values. That refers to this x interval from negative one to two. And then this refers to the y interval from one to three. Okay, so let's uh let's first integrate with respect to x and then with respect to y. All right, so we've got this integral set up, so let's just attack it. Here we go. Some, the way I like to do these is I like to just, you know, leave this whole thing uh, alone. And then we'll just come back to it. And instead, I'm going to say, hey, let's do the inner integral. Yeah, it's a little bit lazy. It just prevents me from having to rewrite the entire expression over again. So I'll just deal with the inner integral first. So from x to negative 1 to x to 2, we're integrating dx. Well, that's the same thing as integrating one dx. And so integrating a constant, we just get x being evaluated from x equals negative one to x equals two. And again, this may feel like overkill now, but I hope you thank me later when the problems get more complicated. All right, so let's go ahead and evaluate this. Um, sure enough, plug in x for two and then subtract, plugging in x for negative one. We end up with three. So let's just pause and think about what we what we got here. Um, well, in a way, did you a a a or an a an a geometric interpretation of the integral of dx from uh, oops negative one to two. Let's get that right. I don't know. I could just draw this on top of that. Well. When you're integrating the constant one, we think of this as, hey, that's y is equal to one or f of x. 
is equal to one. And so you could think of that as this function. You're integrating this function over this interval. And sure enough, you get three. And we were taught originally to say, hey, that matches. Um, well, this is, there we go, that looks better. That's one and this is zero. That matches the area because you've got one unit of area, two units of area, and three units of area. Uh, and while that's, that's not incorrect, you can also think of this as we just integrated sort of a length differential, which maybe is something we haven't said before. Uh, maybe it's something I'm just kind of making up. It's a length differential, dx, the change in the x length. And three, well, yes, it's since one geometrically gives us one by three has an area of three, it also matches the length, the overall length of our interval as well is also length three. So I wanna just pause and, and think about that idea because we'll come back to that on the next slide as to why I wanna say like, hey, when you integrate the length differential, you get the length of uh, an interval that you're integrating over. Now, this isn't true if you've got some kind of a fancy function in there. It's, it's, and you know, you got x squared plus one dx integrating that from one to two is not going to give you the arc length. There's a whole different thing for the arc length because it's not a straight line. But when you're just integrating over the length differential of dx, uh, just to make it pretty, we slap a one in there, then you're going to get the length of the interval that you're integrating over. Okay, back to the task at hand. And if I were a better person, I would have used blue on this whole thing to emphasize it was the blue integral. So you know what, we'll fix, I'll fix the conclusion. That's blue and that's nice. All right, so now we're ready to tackle our outer integral and I'll get smarter as we go. We'll use red for this one. So we're gonna integrate from y equals one to y equals three. The expression that we got when after evaluating the inner integral, which is just three. We're now going to integrate this thing with respect to y. Well, again, now we've effectively reduced the problem to a calc one problem that we understand, single variable. Integrating through with respect to y gives us three times y. We're going to evaluate that from y equals one to y is equal to three. That's going to give us three times three minus three times one. And that's going to give us nine minus three is six. Now, wait a minute. Originally, I said, hey, we're going to find the area of this rectangle. And I never really explained why it was going to work yet. And so that's what we're going to try and do now. We'll just put the calculus aside for the moment. I guess I should come up here to the top and say, hey, our answer. There we go. So put the calculus aside for a moment. And what is the area of this rectangle? But we didn't need calculus to solve this problem. Every one of you knows that the area of a rectangle is length times width, and our length has a length of three, as we did found out with calculus, but we can also just count, and a uh, sort of width or height of two, and three times two gives us a rectangle of area six. And so it's nice to be able to confirm that, yeah, this, this newfangled calculus way of calculating area using double integrals, at least of a rectangle, gave us the correct answer. All right, so now before we proceed to the next slide, I want you just to pause and, and follow along with me for a second and go back to this idea that I've got in blue, this kind of square bracket here, the idea that integrating the length differential gives us the length of the interval. Now, that's the inner integral. The outer integral means that for every value of y from one and two, three, we're going to do this integration, the, the inner blue integral. So for every single, we're basically letting y vary from one all the way up to three. I should do that in red because it's y. We're letting y vary all the way from one up to three here. And so at every step along the way, I'm going to get most of this is what y is equal to, uh, I don't know, 1.2 or something. Uh, and we're going to get a slice of length three. 
And then we're going to get another slice of length three. And we're thinking of these slices as infinitely thin slices of area. Um, and as you sum all these up, letting y vary from one all the way up to three, you're eventually going to shade in this entire area and get the whole, uh, the entire area of the actual rectangle. So we're slicing y from one to three, and we're integrating along each of those slices our inner integral value. And that's how we get our area. So what we just did, I sort of alluded to this is where we're headed, thinking about integrating this as the length differential. What we uh, just integrated was the int we integrated the area differential over a region to find the area of that region. So the area differential is defined as dA is equal to dx dy or dy dx, which begs the question, can we switch the order of integration for this problem? Well, we just did it with uh, inner. We did x with respect to x first and then with respect to y. So we did slices um, from y is equal to 1 all the way up to 3 and sort of filled in our area that way. Could we do it the other direction? The answer is going to be yes. That should probably not be surprising to you guys. And so now x is the outermost integral. So we're going to slice along x. And we're going to fix the x values from negative 1 to 2. And for each of those, we're going to do this, uh, this integral with respect to y. And we're going to generate these, these lengths, these thin, thin lengths that we're going to sum up and get the entire, um, the entire area as we let x vary from negative 1 to 2. OK, so uh, inner integral inner integral, integral from y equals 1 to y equals 3 of dy. Well, that's just y evaluated from y equals 1 to y equals 3. And again, all these extra y's probably feel like a little overkill. But again, I'm just going to ask you to bear with me. And hopefully, uh, by the end of these two coming sections, you'll see why I like to keep track of things. All right, so we know our inner integral. Now it's time to tackle the outer integral. We're going to do from x equals negative 1 to x is equal to 2. And we're going to slap that 2 in that we got from the result of the inner integral. Now we're going to integrate that with respect to x, where that's going to give us 2x evaluated from x equals negative 1 to x equals 2. And sure enough, that's going to give us r6 that we need. 2 times 2 minus 2 times negative 1 gives us 4 plus 2 is 6, as we saw before. Right. While integrating uh, the area differential over a rectangular region is nice, what else can we do? Well, now we're ready to talk about volume between a surface and the input plane. Oftentimes, this is just called the volume under the surface, and you're just given a surface that's above the plane. But thinking back to Calc 1, we used to do problems where, um, you know, we'd find areas of sine and things like that, where you have some positive area. Uh, I don't know, positive is good, negative is bad. That's not true. Negative is sometimes good, but yeah. And we had some negative area uh, down here, and they would sum out to zero. And so you had to kind of break up the pieces uh, of the function and integrate them and, and then add together the pieces of area, uh, taking absolute values and things to make that work out. Same thing applies to calc two, but I'm pretty sure I don't ask you to do anything where you end up with negative area underneath the curve, underneath the input plane. So hence, I oftentimes just say the volume between the surface and the input plane. So net signed area, again, net signed, because it's the sum of the positive and, and negative, if you don't break apart into multiple integrals, is given by the region R. You're integrating over the region R. So your domain region, oops, let's get these uh, different colors here. So that looks like orange, right? This little area here is orange, R is orange. So yeah, you're integrating over the region R. That's going to be your domain region that you're integrating over. And we're integrating the surface, f of x equals z, uh, with respect to the area differential, gives you the volume under the surface. So again, similar to Calc 1, volume above the xy plane is positive. Volume below it is negative. Let's do an example. 
Here we're going to take a look at the volume between the xy plane and the surface c is equal to xy plus e to the y power over the region, uh, the 3 by 4 by 1 by 2 rectangle in the xy plane. So it's kind of a nice picture of this and the integrals already set up for us. We're going to integrate with respect to x first and then y. And when we're doing this, we're fixing y values and we're going to sum up those y values uh, integrating the inputs across like this from, oops, that arrow is backwards. All right, so we're going from y equals one to y equals two. We're going to sum up these little slices. And each of these little slices is going to correspond to an area slice under the curve. And as we let that vary, we're going to generate the entire area under the curve. All right, so our inner integral, inner, Sorry, just taking a moment to copy. All right, now we're ready to integrate this thing with respect to x. And so since we're starting out here, I'm gonna take a moment to just highlight what we're interested in. Okay, that means the y, whoops, the y and that e to the y expression, those are both constants. So they're coming along for the ride. All right, so this equals, uh, well, integrating x with respect to x gives us one half x squared times that constant y coming along for the ride, plus e to the y. Well, if this was seven, you'd say seven x. And so it's e to the y times x because e to the y behaves as a constant. And we're gonna evaluate this from x equals three to x is equal to four. All right, plugging this in, we get one half uh, times four squared y plus e to the y power times four minus the entire quantity, one half times three squared y plus e to the y times three. All right, so tidying up as we go, uh, there's gonna be a whole lot of twos, that's 16 divided by two, that's eight y plus four e to the y minus, uh, that's gonna be nine halves, y uh, minus three e to the y. So uh, minus four e to the y and minus three e to the y are going to give us just a single e to the y that is positive. Eight y minus nine halves y is going to give us seven halves y. And we did it, but we're not done. All we've done is found the value of that inner integral. Now we're ready to do the outer integral. Now I've given myself two slides for this, so I'm gonna go ahead and pop over to the next slide so I don't run out of room or try and cram it into a space where there's not quite enough room to do it. Well, I think I've got enough room looking at my notes, so there we go. We'll just go ahead and do that, there we go. All right, so here is our outer integral and I'm just gonna start it over here. Sometimes when you're working with these tiny slides, you got to use the, the, what, I don't know, area, a loud surface, I don't know, there's a word, I can't think of it. All right, so we're going to replace, we're going to do our outer integral, but we're going to replace it with the result of our inner integral. And again, notice that, hey, as we expected, all of those terms are going to be in terms of y. There are no x's anymore. We already dealt with the x stuff. All right, now integrating um, from y equals 1 to 2, the expression 7 halves y plus e to the y, that's pretty straightforward. Again, calc 1 type stuff. This is going to give us um, 7 over 4 y to the second power plus e to the y evaluated from y is equal to 1 to y is equal to 2. Now, in relatively poor, but not altogether terrible, use of the available um, real estate. That's what I was looking for. The available real estate on the paper. Here we go. We'll continue this calculation up here. So first, we're going to evaluate y is equal to 2. We're going to have 7 over 4 times 2 squared plus e to the 2 power minus, now for y is equal to 1, 7 over 4 times 1 squared plus e to the 
first power. Tidying all this jazz up, and those are going to reduce away nicely, and we're going to get just 7 plus e to the second power minus 7 fourths minus e. 7 minus 7 fourths gives us 21 fourths. I hope it's okay that I'm skipping the fraction math in the interest of trying to make these videos shorter, but that's the result. So yeah, that result, um, I didn't work it out as a decimal equivalent and notice the graph is scaled differently. The Z axis is definitely small. So trying to estimate that as the volume would be kind of a challenge anyway. And we'll just leave that as the, uh, answer for the volume under. Now that was fun. So I've been claiming that we can do things the other way. So let's do it the other way. Let's switch the order of integration. Okay, so now we're going to uh, vary across the x axis. So I'm going to vary from three to four. And at each point of that way, I'm going to take a slice of this input domain and let those vary. And what we're gonna end up doing is we're gonna end up adding up all of these little slices of area underneath, infinitely thin slices of volume, if you will, little thin slices of area to get an actual answer for the volume. All right, and here goes the game. Inner integral, we're gonna do integral from y is equal to one to y is equal to two of x, y plus e to the y dy. Once again, not a half bad idea as we're starting out to kind of really clearly identify the values that we're gonna integrate and our variables and the values that are gonna be treated as constants, in this case, that x. All right, so this is gonna give us the constant x comes along for the ride, integrating y with respect to y gives us one half y squared plus e to the y integrates as e to the y with respect to y. Evaluating this from y equals one to y equals two. Go ahead and plug in. All right, I'm gonna just go ahead and write that as one half x. And then we're gonna have substitute two in for the y value plus e to the two minus, now substituting in for the y equals one, we're gonna have one half x times one squared plus e to the first power. Okay, uh, four, divided by two is gonna give us two x plus e to the two minus uh, one half x plus, oh, whoops, uh, distribute your negative, minus e to the first power. Two uh, x minus one half x gives us three halves x plus e to the second minus e. Now I'm gonna go ahead and use my second slide on this problem. So now we've done our inter, inner integral and we've got our result for that inner integral. We use that as the integrand for our outer integral. So outer integral integrate from uh, x is equal to three to x is equal to four. The result of our prior integral, three over two x plus e to the second power minus e to the first, which is just e dx. Now, this is a single variable calculus problem. So let's go ahead and integrate it. We're going to have 3 quarters x to the second power plus x e to the second minus x e, all evaluated for x equals 3 to x equals 4. Substituting in for x equals 4, we get 3 quarters uh, times 4 squared plus four e to the second power minus four e minus, substituting now in for x equals to three, um, three quarters times three squared plus three e to the second power uh, minus three e. And I apologize for running out of room there. Now, what do we got here? Three quarters times 16 is 12 plus 4e squared minus 4e minus 27 over 4 minus 3e squared 
plus 3e. Combining like terms and doing the fraction uh, subtraction at the beginning, we get 21 over 4 plus e to the second power minus e to the first power, just like we did on the prior slide. So there's our volume underneath the surface. Z is equal to xy plus e to the y power over the rectangular region R and the input plane. Uh, so yeah, let's do another example. This time a little bit harder one. Uh, so find the sine volume uh, of z is equal to y arctangent of one over x over the rectangular region uh, in the one by root three in the x direction by one by seven in the y direction. So it looks like we've got three slides coming with a conclusion slide here at the end. So we should have lots of room to do this on. Okay, so you should be able to do this in either order you want to. I am going to choose to slice in the y direction. And so I am going to choose to slice from one to seven. So from one all the way up to seven there, I'm gonna take slices in the y direction. For each of those slices, I'm going to generate a slice that looks like that in the x direction. So now I'm going to erase that so I can draw the little area. And then this, as I integrate that fixed y value, letting x vary, I'm going to end up with this nice little infinitely thin slice of volume or area, if you will, that we're going to let it vary. I'm going to take slices all the way along the y-axis and sum them all up to get the volume underneath. So how are we going to set this integral? up. Well, here's the way I like to do this. I've made my decisions. Now I'm ready to set the integral up. The direction you're doing your slices is always going to be the outer most integral. So I said I'm going to take slices over the y-axis from 1 to 7. So I'm going to let y vary from 1 to 7. And so I first I'll put down my differential so I know that, all right, the outer integral I'm slicing letting taking slices uh, in the y direction, and then I'll write down those y limits of integration. Next, well, I've narrowed down the choices, so there really isn't any further choice. It has to be x on the inner integral. And so first I'll label my differential dx, and then we'll go ahead and put the x limits of integration, x equals one to x equals root three. And then last but not least, it's time to put your function in y arctangent one over x. Okay, so integrating arctangent is always a fun time. Let's see how this one plays out. So first things first, as usual, we're going to tackle our inner integral. And I don't, yeah, we're gonna tackle our inner integral. Our inner integral is this. Uh, X varies from one to root three. Uh, y arc tangent of one over x dx. Well, since y is a constant, you know, let's highlight the stuff we're interested in. We're integrating with respect to x, so that's we're going to have to deal with, and those are important. But that y is a constant, so since it's a constant, I don't want to bring it along for the ride. I'm going to go ahead and pop it out of the integral. Same as if we had seven in there, we could just pop that seven out in front and focus strictly on the relative challenge of integrating an expression involving arctangent. So how are we going to do this? Well, spoiler alert, little known fact about me, I'm a little lazy. Uh, I like to be real careful in math, but I'm a little lazy. So sometimes I don't like to rewrite everything. So I'll just put a pin in it, label it circle star, and be like, we'll come back to circle star later. Uh, so what are, what are we going to do here? Well, I'm going to ignore, and we'll come back for this y later, and I'm going to focus just on integrating arctangent. 
And how do you integrate arctangent? Well, sitting back and saying, okay, the integral asks effectively, what has the derivative of arctangent of one over X? That's one heck of a question. I don't have any idea what has the derivative of arctangent of X. So when I don't have any ideas, and I know you substitution isn't gonna help me at all, you know what, let's try integration by parts. And in fact, if I were to assign a problem like this, I would uh, give you the hint that this involves integration by parts. So integration by parts, a brief review. And you know what, let's, uh, I got three slides. So let's just go ahead and start this on the next slide. All right, so integration by parts. All right, so you may have heard this a different way, but the way I like to remember this is uv minus integral v du. uv minus integral v. And again, I give my v's ta tails. It's a habit I have. Uh, just, yeah, du. And so once you've done that, this actually comes from the integral u dv. So it's your job to identify u and dv. Okay, so our integral is, let's get it in here. I'm not gonna write the bounds. I'm just gonna be a little lazy. We'll come back for those later. You know what, I'll put a couple dots in there to remind myself, hey, there are limits of integration you need to address. So don't forget about them. Okay, so we need u, v, and du, and the related dv. Now, when I teach this in Calc 2, I generally try and teach that you should, uh, the, the U, your choice of U expression is something that should, quote, get nicer under differentiation. Um, and then DV should be as much of the uh, problem as you can integrate. Well, in this case, I'm looking at my choices here are just two things. I have the differential and the function itself. And we're doing integration by parts because we can't integrate the function by its, of itself. So the only choice that makes any sense is to just have dv be our differential because we can integrate one and we'll get x. Integrating, you know, to find v, you just integrate both sides of this and you get, hey, v is equal to x. All right, so that means that the only other choice we have is we have to have arctangent of one over x be our choice of u. And that's nice because while I can't integrate arctangent, I do know how to take the derivative of arctangent. It's gonna require a chain rule, but what we're gonna have is the derivative of the outside function, one over one plus something squared, evaluated at the inside unchanged, and so we'll have one over x there, times the derivative of the inside function. And now that's gonna be negative one over x squared. Get a parentheses in there so we don't accidentally make it subtraction or something like that. Okay. Now, well, that's all nice and grand. I think that this du expression, given that I'm going to use it, um, I might like to tidy up the algebra of du. And so I'm sort of, there's not a ton of room. I'm gonna reserve the spot right here for the simplified version, we're gonna go up, up here and kind of simplify that expression. Okay, so first things I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the negative one over x squared on top of my fraction. I'm gonna put that as one plus one over x squared in the denominator. And say, hey, I, uh, that's got a lot going on. I noticed that if I just multiply this thing by x squared over x squared, I can kind of make it significantly better. And that's okay to do this as you all absolutely know, because we're really just multiplying by one there. And multiplying and quantity by one doesn't change its actual overall value. So you get negative one on top and you get x squared plus one and it's negative the derivative of arctangent. Okay, so let's write that down here. We've got negative one over x squared plus one. That's significantly tidier. Okay, ready, set, go. Now it's time to apply our integration by parts. So I'll be a little more diligent here. We'll rewrite our original function that we're integrating. 
Oops, I should have left just slightly more room there. I'm going to put u v minus integral v d u there. And now we substitute in these values. X, uh, v is x, u is arc tangent of x. So I'm going to write them in the wrong order. We're going to write x arc tangent of 1 over x. Hey, here's a caution. As I worked this problem the original time, and then as I revisited it later, I uh, let 1 over x, it is the input of arctangent, accidentally become x, just in sort of laziness and accidental writing. Perhaps not laziness. It was just unintentionally copied it wrong. So yeah, here's a little bit of caution. Don't let your 1 over x become just x. I think I read it as x. OK, now substituting in uh, negative integral, we need a v is x and du. du is negative 1 over uh, x squared plus 1. Where's our differential? Wait a minute. When you take the derivative of u is equal to arctangent of x, you should get du is equal to the derivative dx, right? dx. There's our dx. So let's get that dx in there as well. OK. With any luck, we will be able to do this integral. So that's great. We're going to rewrite that by just copying it with a quote, meaning quote the line above, minus. All right, so what have we got here? We've got, uh, yeah, you know what? Let's, uh, let's go ahead and do this. Let's deal with that negative. Just by popping a negative one out in front of my integral, I get that positive now. So now my integral is x over x squared plus one dx. Now I hope you'll forgive me in reusing the arbitrary variable u here, because I'm looking at this thing and I say, that smells an awful lot like a u substitution or just a substitution. Because I see x squared plus one in the denominator and then its expression well, not its expression, but its derivative-ish in the form of x dx in the numerator. So let's use a u substitution here. And since I have space off to the right, I'll just kind of write uh, u is equal to x squared plus 1, du is equal to 2x dx. And then solving for dx, which is one of the ways I like to do u substitutions, I get 1 over 2 x du is what I can substitute in for dx directly. Let me erase these greens. OK. All right, so let me see what colors have I not used. OK, so here's my u. That's what I'll substitute in for u. And here's dx. And I'll substitute that value in for dx. There we go. OK, we've got another line, so we better have equals quote plus integral x over u dx becomes 1 over 2x du. OK, so our x's nicely reduce away, which is great because they were problematic, but now they're not a problem. That's how u substitutions work. And uh, hey, what's the derivative of 1 half times 1 over u? Well, that one half just comes out, and one over u gives us the integral. Integrating one over u, we ask, what is one over u the derivative? It's the derivative of ln, and so ln of u. Better have keep our line carrying on so the work is relatively clear. All right, so now we are at the point where we can reverse our u substitution. There is equal to plus one half ln of uh, x squared plus 1. Now, those absolute values are unnecessary because x squared plus 1 is always going to be a positive value. So we'll just go ahead and put it like that. OK, so we've done that first innermost integral. We better get back to the problem. OK, so I believe we, we stuck a pin in it a couple pages ago. And we stuck a pin in it, y times the integral of our inner integral. 
is equal to circle star. So we'll just go ahead and pick back up after circle star and say, hey, circle star is equal to y times integral from x equals one to x equals root three, uh, arc tangent one over x dx. So we just found out that the result of that integral is x arc tangent of one over x plus one half ln of, that looks like an h, let's do it better, ln of x squared plus one, and those don't need to be there. Now we'll close up that parenthesis, and we'll evaluate this rig from x equals one to x equals the square root of three. In doing so, we have y times root three arc tangent of one over root three plus one half ln of root three squared plus one minus y times, now we're ready to substitute in for one. Uh, well, x is one, it's just gonna be one times arc tangent, and we're gonna have arc tangent of one over one, which is just going to be one, plus one half ln of one squared plus one, and we've done that. Okay, ready, steady, go. What do we have here? All right, so this is equal to y times root three. Well, arc tangent of one over root three is pi over six plus one half ln of root three plus one gives us three plus one gives us four and takes care of our first expression minus y times arc tangent of one well, that's pi over four plus one half ln of one plus one that's ln of two all right now you can, uh, what are we going to do now? Because all I see is a bunch of big numbers. I see this number and I see this number. Maybe they're not big numbers, big complicated numbers. Those are just constants, right? So what I'm going to do at this point is something a little bit tricky. I'm going to factor out the y expression. Meant to be an arrow, not a very good arrow, but hopefully you get the idea. When I factor out the y expression, I'm going to get everything in the first parenthesis minus everything in the second parenthesis. And so those parentheses, I can now distribute and tidy things up. And if you do that, you get y is equal to uh, three pi over six is pi over two plus one half. And I know there are logarithm rules that can simplify this stuff down, but I'm reasonably confident in my answer and I'm just gonna leave it the way it is right now. So distributing that negative sign, I get minus pi over four and then minus one half ln of two. Okay, so that is a perfectly good number. And in fact, I'm gonna name this number A. And so I'm gonna call this Y times A. And just let A be that constant. That way I don't have to copy it down a bunch of times and risk maybe writing it down wrong. Also, it's going to make the writing of the, uh, the next integral a little bit easier. Because what have we just done? Inner integral, done. This is the result of the inner integral. We still have to come back for the outer integral. So let's do the outer integral on this last page. So now we're ready to tackle this outer integral. And so that's the integral from y equals 1 to y is equal to 7 of the expression that big number or that number, I don't know if it's big or not, that, that constant number we're calling a times y. So we'll have it a times y dy. And so again, integrating with respect to y means I'm only interested in that a will just come along for the ride as a constant. And so what do we get? We get a over two y squared evaluated from y equals one to y is equal to seven. Ready, steady, go. That simplifies relatively nicely as a over two times seven squared minus a over two times one squared is equal to 
48 times a over two, maybe I should have written that in the other order, it's fine, 24 a. And if you fire up a calculator, we find that 24 a is equal to the volume that we're actually interested in, and it's approximately 11.2388 units to the third power, whatever, centimeters, feet, inches, whatever we're dealing with. Now, I thought with such a big, ugly wave of hands like this, I would show you a nice method of using Desmos to do some big calculations for you. All right, here it is. If you notice, I, I, when you write A is equal to some, some constant expression, Desmos will just hold on to that exact expression. Oh, well, it'll round it off, but to far many enough decimal places that we won't get a rounding mistake. But it'll, it'll store that exact expression in its memory. And then you can call it in the second field, 24 times A, which is what I had written. And there you got your 11.23, et cetera, as your answer. If you're looking at this first field and wondering why doesn't that match what you had on the prior page, Brian, it's because I got a little fancy with uh, logarithm rules and kind of simplified things down to as sort of much as you can, if you will. Anyway, you type in that other expression, you will get the same answer. And that brings us to a close.